Greetings once again to our Pleasant Green parishioners, our congregation at large, and to our listening audience. Uh, We thank God again for this opportunity uh, to share uh, this particular lesson that has already been established for this day, June the 20th, 2021. And this is out of our uh, summer commentary, Faith Pathway. And uh, it's Unit 1, addressed as Jesus teaches about faith. Jesus teaches about faith. And the title for our lesson is A Healing Touch. Our devotional reading is Proverbs, the third chapter, uh, verses 1 through 8. Our background scriptures are the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 through 26. Mark, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 43. And Luke, the 8th chapter, verses 40 through 56. And our printed passage <clears throat> is Matthew, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 26. And our key verse, I will be reading the NIV But our key verse is the 22nd verse of the ninth chapter of Matthew. And it reads, Jesus turned and saw her. Take heed, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Our lesson's aims are examine the nature of the faith involved in the healings of the woman and the girl in this passage. Sense the power of God to bring life and healing to your loved ones and concluding with rejoice in the healing power of God as manifested in your own life. Now, our lesson has three parts to it, and uh, they are centered around the main topic, uh, which is faith. But the first part, the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 18 through 19, uh, is read, by faith, go to Jesus. And then the second part is, by faith, reach for Jesus. And this is verses 20 through 22. And then our concluding verses are the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 23 through 26, and it ends by saying, by faith, trust in Jesus. So we first have, go to Christ, reach for Christ, and trust in Christ. All by faith. So our lesson opens up with the 18th verse uh, of the ninth chapter of Matthew. And it tells us that while he spoke these things unto them, behold, there was a certain ruler who worshiped him saying, my daughter, is even now dead, but come and lay thy hands upon her, and she shall live. 
in the NIV, instead of the King James, it says a synagogue leader. And in the commentary of our lesson, it describes the certain ruler, the synagogue leader, as a Pharisee. Uh, but it 19 says that regardless to how we describe the individual that approached Christ, it says that Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, as we uh, begin to uh, try to unravel this and delve into the understanding that Christ would have for us to receive. Uh, we want to ask the Lord to guide us and direct us in this lesson and then impart unto us the significance of the lesson and what you would have us to know. And then, as always, uh, we ask that what you do teach us and what you do have for us to learn and understand that we would be compelled and convicted by your spirit that we would live out the things that you impart unto us. In the name of Christ, we ask it. Amen. Now, one of the things to uh, note here is the quick response that Jesus gave once he was approached uh, by the man, <clears throat> the synagogue uh, leader, Pharisee, or ruler. Um, there was no hesitation. Uh, there wasn't a waiting period. Uh, Christ did not um, tell uh, the man that I'll be there as soon as I can, or I will come tomorrow, or I'll send a messenger to you uh, when I can arrive. And I think it uh, would serve purpose if we were to just look at uh, the activities prior to the approach uh, by the man who was concerned about the death of his daughter. And if we would just look at the beginning of the ninth chapter of Matthew, uh, it kind of brings us into the mode and the uh, operation, uh, the um, uh, somewhat motive or the uh, spirit, the presence of the flow of what Christ was involved in when he was approached. So at the beginning of the ninth chapter of Matthew, we recognize that it involves the healing of the paralytic man. So Jesus has healed the paralytic man and then was questioned by some of the scribes uh, that actually saw of the healing take place. And Christ began to answer them uh, first to inquire of them why did they have these evil thoughts in their heart. And then he ex explains to them of the power that he possesses, that he is able to forgive sins on earth and he is also able to heal. He has miraculous power. And then after this encounter, then we see that in his travels, once he leaves this group, he, he passes a man by the name of Matthew. Uh, he's seated in his office, and he tells Matthew, who is the tax collector, he tells him to follow me. And Matthew, right away, without hesitation, got up and he followed Christ. And then Christ is approached by some Pharisees 
because they begin to try and discredit the character of Christ by the company that Christ keeps. And so they identified that, look, he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. So the Pharisees, and uh, I coined this term, the Pharisaic sinners, and I don't know if that's a actual term or not, but it was fitting, so I thought I would use it. But the Pharisaic sinners tried to discredit Christ because he was in the company of other sinners. But because the Pharisees had exalted themselves uh, to a place and a status that they felt they were deemed to then look down upon others. And so to discredit the works of Christ and the power and the ability of Christ and who Christ actually represented, they began to try to defame him by saying, look at who he's hanging with. He's hanging around with these tax collectors. Now, y'all know y'all don't like tax collectors, but look who he's hanging out with. And then look at the character, the status of the people he, he's with. He's with all these sinners. He's not hanging out with us, you know, the upper crust. You know, he's not uh, uh, making his company uh, with people who are established in the society, but he's hanging out with the undesirables. And so uh, he moves on from here, and then he identifies the problem that the Pharisees and scribes and others had, and he wraps it up in the parable of the cloth and the wineskins. He identifies that we sometimes become so conditioned into our own schemes and agendas that we can't get anything new poured into our spirit because we've become accustomed and conditioned by the mores and the morals and the values that we've adopted to maintain our so-called establishment or our so-called prestige and status. And so he identifies it as you cannot pour new wine into an old garment because the old garment does not have the flexibility to expand, to receive the new wine. And this leads us into his encounter being approached by the ruler who has a daughter that he himself had said was already dead. But if you come and lay hands upon her, she shall live. And this brings us into the beginning of our lesson. And a couple of things that we just want to cite uh, one is uh, the belief, because the lesson is about faith. And so one is the belief that the synagogue ruler demonstrated. Now, we've already identified that certain uh, characters from synagogue dwellings, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, chief priests, they were always questioning Christ. The works of Christ had already circulated in the region. People were already talking about this man, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. They were already discussing 
the marvelous works that Christ was performing, that Jesus was doing. And so the word had gotten around. But this ruler who also heard about the works of Christ, the text tells us that he knelt, he bowed down before this man that had uh, germinated so much of a discourse, so many different discussions and talks and arguments about who is this man. And so he was already aware of it, but he presents himself in a position of homage and respect and reverence to Jesus. And upon his approach and upon his belief, regardless to what some of his comrades and company may have said about Christ in his presence, regardless to maybe what his response was in the company of those who were who were not uh, advocates but adversaries of Christ, regardless to that, when he was in the presence of Christ, in the presence of Jesus, he bowed and showed reverence. He exercised his belief in whom personally he thought Jesus was. So, He knelt upon the heart of his faith. He reached out to Jesus to do what he believed in spite of those around him, but what he believed Christ could do. Another thing we should look at here is is that although He was a ruler of the synagogue. The text does not tell us that he went to one of the Pharisees and asked them to heal his daughter. It didn't say that he inquired of the chief priest or the scribes or the Sadducees or any of the other onlookers. The text tells us that he approached Jesus. But it doesn't tell us that he wasted any time trying to uh, get a meeting or to get a time or to have an encounter with any of the other so-called powers that be to bring his daughter back to life. He sought whom he knew had the power to bring life back to that which appeared dead. So now, the next part of our lesson says, by faith, reach for Jesus. And this encounters the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. And uh, it tells us how that uh, she approached Christ from the rear, from behind Christ. Um, Now, when we think about that, uh, as we really look into uh, the condition and to, to get Uh, a better understanding um, of her situation and her condition uh, would be worthwhile for us to read uh, in Leviticus, the 15th chapter uh, of Leviticus, starting at the 19th verse. And then also, I believe it is in the 18th chapter of Leviticus, and again, the 19th verse. And then uh, I think also in the 20th 
chapter of Leviticus and the uh, 18th verse. But when we read this, we find out how according to the Levitical law that uh, it was deemed that when a woman was in her customary time of impurity, uh, that uh, it was deemed uh, for her not to interact with others and for no one else to interact with her until her time of impurity had passed. And uh, after it passed, there was a period of seven days before then she could be welcomed back into the company of those in her immediate surroundings, her family, uh, her spouse, uh, definitely not the priest. And so because this condition that she encountered um, had gone on for 12 years, as the text reveals to us, she had been excommunicated and um, somewhat ostracized. Uh, it was unclean for anyone around her to be within her company and also uh, definitely not any of the priests or rabbis. So um, she was almost treated as though she had leprosy. And we know that the lepers actually had a isolated community where they couldn't even come out in the general uh, dwelling and public of the rest of the uh, Hebrew Israelites in that time. They couldn't come out in the overall community and company of others. And so uh, when we think about the text saying that, and she came up from behind, um, it was almost as though she was trying to approach in a manner where she would not be readily identified and it will allow her the chance before someone cited her that she might be able to just touch the hem of his garment. And her faith was in not only what the outer garment represented, because the outer garment had different items attached to the garment, to identify the power of the one who was inside the garment. And so her faith was not just that if I can touch the fabric, but if I can just touch the hem of the garment of the one who is in the garment, then I believe that I will be healed. Now, the text says that uh, it was ceremonially unclean for her to touch a priest or a rabbi. And what we should identify here is, is that she didn't touch a priest or a rabbi. Although Christ was referred to as rabboni or rabbi or teacher, but who she touched was more than just a priest or a rabbi. She touched salvation. She touched the anointed. She touched the balm of Gilead. And so she knew that if I can just get close enough, I know there will be a crowd but if I can somewhat disguise myself and get through the crowd and just get close enough that I can just touch the hem of his garment, well, then I believe that I will be healed. And the commentary tells us that uh, two distinctions I want to lift here. It says the text reveals the woman's confidence that she would be instead of could be. 
healed. This is the distinction there. Uh, she felt that she would be healed, not that maybe I could be healed, but that I would. And it also says to us that once she touched Christ, immediately he felt the urgency of one drawing from him the power to relieve and to heal. And sometimes even we ourselves can be engaged with family members or others who maybe are distraught or who maybe are encountering some things and we may embrace each other and we can feel that there is a pulling and a drawing on our persona to address a need from theirs. And so if we can encounter our little selves, if we can encounter the pulling of one who has an urgency, a need, something they uh, seek to fulfill, if we can encounter a draw from our own energy to another, surely when one in the situation that the woman was found, for all the years that she had been awaiting a relief from this condition, surely Christ felt the great need and pull based upon her faith as she touched his garment. So we want to close out with the second part, or I'm sorry, the third part of our lesson, uh, by faith, trust in Jesus. And as he was on his way to the rope to the uh, ruler in the synagogue's house, after the woman encountered him in travel to get there. Then it tells us that he entered the synagogue's leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes. And he immediately, his first response was, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand. And she got up. And news of this spread throughout the region. And it, it tells us that once he approached the synagogue leader's house, that he recognized the atmosphere, the environment. It wasn't that Christ could not do the healing with the company that was present. It was that the company that was present were exerting a a vibe. They were exerting a presence that was in contrast to the work and the miraculous uh, um, exercise that was getting ready to take place. Their response when Christ said to them to go away, their response they went from, now these were paid musicians 
and mourners. When people would pass, it was customary during that time that family would hire musicians and mourners and they would come and play music and then they would cry and they had chants and things that they would recite of supposedly providing comfort to the grieving family. And this was a normal practice, uh, but they did not understand who Christ was. They went from crying and chanting and playing music for mourners and grieving families to hysterically laughing, almost to the point that they were mocking Jesus as he must be insane. Did he just say that uh, she's not dead, that she's just asleep? Oh, my goodness, he's out of his mind. The girl is dead. They, they, we're in the actual ceremony to, to honor her in, in the normal format in which we do. So Christ said, all of you all, leave. Sometimes we just need to remove certain elements that are not fitting for the Lord's work. There's some things that they just aren't appropriate for what is about to take place. It's not that Jesus couldn't have performed the healing with them there. It's just that they were not of the right spirit to experience what was about to happen. And because they were inappropriately present and not in the same spirit of what was about to take place, Christ understood that this element, this spirit, this behavior needs to be removed so that those that believe will not be distracted by the onlookers. Sometimes we have to remove certain settings, certain vibes, certain spiritual presence. Sometimes that has to be removed so that we can receive the work of God. And so I certainly hope that we have lifted something uh, in the uh, lesson. Um, uh, one of the uh, commentaries I would like to uh, 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 say in the closing, uh, it talked about uh, while those who were in the house showed no signs of faith, Jairus actually demonstrated his faith. He didn't have any doubt that the Lord was not able to again bring his daughter to life. Jairus believed and then exercised his belief. So as we often say, faith without works is dead. Jairus actually exercised and demonstrated his faith. And because his faith was without challenge without doubt he received that which he believed would happen and isn't that a testimony for us all and so I again uh, hope that something was said that uh, shed some light onto this. In fact, the name Jairus actually means God enlightens. God enlightens. So we hope that something in this lesson 
has led to some enlightenment for all of us who've participated and listened and took the time to draw into it. So as always, our prayer is that God's blessings will be upon you, that God's uh, protection and safety will indwell with you at all times, uh, and that most certainly that Uh, we will be pleasing our actions, our thoughts, our speech will be pleasing and acceptable unto God. And we ask it all in the name of Christ and for his sake we ask it. Amen. God bless you.